Hello and welcome to another episode of Terribly Drawn History. Today, we're going to be discussing the Gallipoli Campaign. This campaign can best be described as an attempt by the Allies to link up with their Russian counterparts by pushing through the Dardanelles Straits, taking Constantinople, and capitulating the Ottoman Turks. The British and the Ottomans generally had good relations at the time. This was ruined by actions taken by the British at the start of the war. Sometime before the war, the British had given two warships to the Ottomans. However, upon the advent of the conflict, the British decided to recall that loan. This, along with the rise of a new political faction named the Young Turks, pushed the Ottomans to join the Central Powers. Now that the Ottomans joined ranks with the Central Powers, the Germans sent one of their generals to reform the military. He was quite successful. The Allies, which included Britain, France, Russia, and later the United States, intended to link their western front with the Russians' eastern attack. Originally Winston Churchill's idea, the campaign on Gallipoli called for a series of British and French warships, a few of them being dreadnoughts, but some of them being outdated, to push through the Dardanelles Straits and into the Black Sea. At the time, Churchill was just a vice admiral, and his plan had to be approved by his superiors. They had doubts about it, and believed that the British warships would best be used fighting the Germans. When all was resolved, Churchill's plan was set in motion. From February to March of 1915, the British warships frequently bombed the ports located on both sides of the Dardanelles Straits, shortly after British marines landed to disrupt the Ottoman forts. However, these actions alerted the Ottomans to the impending assault, and they proceeded to dig in. After this, British warships attempted to push through the straits, but on their way through, they were subjected to heavy attack from the shore guns, and mines that had neither been defused nor detected. The bottleneck shape of the water between the straits would be detrimental to the warships. Two ships were totally decimated, many were damaged or run aground. Following these events, it was decided that a land invasion would be necessary to taking the island of Gallipoli and then moving into mainland Turkey. Sir Ian Hamilton was put in charge of the ground forces, with Herbert Kitchener as a superior. British forces began massing in Egypt. The Ottomans were also busy fortifying their defenses for the coming invasion. On April 25th, the largest amphibious invasion in recorded history was to be attempted. The Anzac forces, a nickname given to Australian and New Zealand military units, landed halfway up north on the island of Gallipoli, while the main British force, supported by the French, landed on Cape Helles. Anzac forces hit the wrong point due to weather, and they disembarked upon a hilly terrain with lack of defenses. They then rushed the enemy, but got scattered in the hilly terrain, trying to take strategic points. At Cape Helles, V and W Beach were heavily defended, Men were pinned down by constant machine gun fire and rows of barbed wire. S, X, and Y Beach were e all easily taken. However, due to confusion among the command structure, these forces did not follow up to aid their allies at VNW. What followed is the First Battle of Kerthia, where the Allied forces attempted to take a nearby hill, Akibaba, and town of Kerthia. This is the first of many battles in this area, as the Allies were repeatedly pushed back and faced heavy casualties. On Anzac Beach, the Allies took a series of trenches at some points 40 yards away from the Turks. Day after day, they fended off Turkish bayonet charges and dug in more and more. Fighting in these trenches was brutal. Wounded soldiers piled up for both the British and the Ottomans. For the British, this meant that they would need to ferry these men back constantly in order to get them help. John Simpson, an Australian stretcher bearer, pulled up over 300 wounded Anzac and Ottoman soldiers before he was killed. The repeated battles at Kerthia are marked by missed opportunities by the British general such as when the Ottomans were pushed back and the British failed to capitalize and gain ground. The commanders attempted to focus their forces from Cape Helles to relieving their Anzac allies, but the Ottomans mounted a counteroffensive on the 19th of May. 30,000 Ottoman Turks attacked the Anzac lines. They were met with fire and around 10,000 would be killed. The bodies would begin to rot and attract flies. Both sides signed a monetary peace agreement to bury the dead, and when they were done, wished each other luck. This is something that happened a few times during the war for some reason. British commander Hamilton wanted to seize the opportunity to take the key summit of Chunik Bar, as his forces had made little to no progress on the rest of the island. In order to engage the Turkish forces, the Allies had to scale the hill. On August 6, troops advanced and were soon met with rifle fire, and attempt after attempt to take the hill were repelled. Every offensive at this point was being stifled, decimating British morale, and causing heavy casualties. As more troops landed on the beach, General Kamal was quick to seize upon the opportunity and attack. General Kamal gained a great deal of prestige in this war, as he was very effective during the campaign. This, coupled with the lackadaisical leadership of the Allies, eventually led to their downfall. At this point, the Allies were exhausted. Unsuccessful battle after battle was taking its toll on the men, and heavy losses meant fresh troops needed to be continually moved in. Sir Ian Hamilton lost respect and support from his followers, and was removed from his role. His superior, Herbert Kitchener, would view the battle and report to his superiors that it was best to seize operations and bring the troops back. 
From December to January of 1916, Allied troops were evacuated meticulously. Using a series of diversionary tactics, they reportedly did not lose a single man in the retreat. Ironically, this was one of the best planned events of the entire campaign. The Allies would lose 58,000 soldiers, and another 200,000 would be wounded. While the Ottoman Empire's numbers are unknown, they are believed to be equal to that of the British. This would be the last attempt to attack the Ottomans in their homeland, and from now on, the Allies' efforts would be focused on the Western Front. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been another episode of Terribly Drawn History. If you liked the video, remember to comment and subscribe. We'll see you again next episode.